you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. It's Christmas Eve here in Dublin. There's a really festive atmosphere. I love this time of year. I hope you're looking forward to the holidays, however you choose to celebrate them. I'd just like to take an opportunity to thank you all for all the encouraging and insightful comments throughout 2022. They mean the absolute world to me. Thank you all for your support. Today's episode is about the tragic and mysterious death of Magdalena Zook while she was on holiday in Egypt. I'd really like to thank the Dark Vanishing subscriber Lynn CRF for this suggestion. It's an intriguing case. So let's get started. Magdalena grew up in southwestern Poland uh, with her parents and her sister. She was incredibly close to them. Now, her father had an alcohol issue. And this could be a source of stress to Magdalena, but in spite of this, she had an incredibly close relationship with her parents. And when Magdalena does get into difficulty in Egypt, uh, you can really see how kind, how caring her parents uh, are. You know, they did everything they could to get her back safely. Magdalena would eventually leave home when she was 15 years old and she was a very determined and driven young woman. She qualified in the area of beautician and dietetics, sort of beauty and dietetics if you like, and she was working as a beautician in the city of Rocklov, also in southwestern Poland. I've actually been there on holiday, would you believe, about six, seven years ago. It is a beautiful city. I've walked on that square. It's stunning. Um, and Magdalena was working, you know, as a beautician in Rockloff. She had also met a man with whom she had a really strong connection, a lot of chemistry. They really hit it off, even though they were only going out three or four months. I think had Magdalena uh, managed to make it back from Egypt safely, this relationship would have endured. Uh, but sadly, it wasn't to be. I'm going to put forward a theory in this video that there were three principal factors that led to the death of Magdalena. One was an acute mental health crisis uh, that she suffered while she was in Egypt. This was worsened or exacerbated by the intake of alcohol in the first 48 hours. And finally, the third factor that contributed to her death, and I feel this was a pivotal factor, was she was the victim of coercive control. Coercive control is a form of abuse which is, uh, you know, very damaging. It's very stressful, even if you have good mental health. But to be subjected to it when you're in the midst of a mental health crisis uh, is really, uh, you know, it's really dangerous. Essentially, it can uh, really, I feel, you know, worsen that mental health crisis. And I feel that it was the pivotal factor in terms of Magdalena's death. Now, if you aren't familiar with the term coercive control, I will explain uh, the term in the video. So let's move forward. So Magdalena was living her best life in Rocklove. She had a job that she loved. She'd fallen in love with Marcus. She really enjoyed fitness and that was something that Marcus enjoyed as well. So they both bonded over that. So everything was coming up roses for Magdalena. She was just 27 years old, but as I said, she was living her best life. So let's go back to April 2017. Marcus wakes up and it's his birthday and Magdalena has surprised him with an all-inclusive trip to Marsa Alam uh, in Egypt, to this very resort that you see in the picture. They were due to leave that day. So this was an incredible surprise and it does speak to the sort of sense of adventure that both Marcus and Magdalena had. This was a very romantic relationship um, and I'm sure they would have taken many more exciting trips like this. Um, there is an issue, however. Marcus has just uh, six months left on his passport before it expires and you have to have more time on your passport prior to its expiration in order to travel to Egypt. It therefore transpired that they weren't in a position to travel to Egypt together. They then decide that, that neither of them will go and Marcus tries to sell the tickets on Facebook but isn't successful. About four hours before they're due to go, he tries to do this. So eventually it's decided that Magdalena will go, that she can sit with an elderly couple for additional security. She's been working hard. Um, you know, this will be a nice break. At least they'll salvage some of the cost. Now, Marcus has received a lot of criticism in relation to this decision, you know, letting his partner 
travel by herself but Magdalena was a grown woman and I think that Marcus was just coming from a really good place you know she'd done this incredible gesture for uh, him he knew that she worked hard he wanted her to get something out of it I'm sure he felt terrible that you know he wasn't able to travel so I think that the criticism of Marcus has been extremely unfair there have also been accusations that he was attempting to sell her into trafficking etc uh, none of which are founded for which there is no proof and we've got to remember that Magdalena bought this trip for him. So again, as I said, I think he was coming from a good place. Marcus would drive Magdalene to the airport later that day. Now, he did say that when he was driving her to the airport, she was tearful. And a lot of people have pointed to this as perhaps evidence that she was having a mental health crisis at this stage. I don't think so. I mean, you're due to fly out together as a couple. You're not going out that long, a few months. You're in the first rows of love. I think there were more tears of disappointment. When Magdalena got to the airport, some passengers uh, that were due to fly on the same plane did notice that she had purchased wine in the uh, probably the duty free shop, but a store within the airport. But a passenger that was sitting beside her on the plane said that she was perfectly fine, perfectly normal, however. But once she arrived to the um, hotel and I was reading that apparently she rented a car and drove a couple of hours to the resort. Uh, but by the time she reached the uh, resort, things started to go downhill very rapidly. She was drinking heavily. Sometimes she would be very quiet. Sometimes she would be very loud and boisterous. She seemed very confused. She was going around looking for Marcus, her boyfriend. She was looking for her parents. Back home, friends and family and Marcus were worried about her because she was sending them texts as if they were there in the resort. I think that at this stage we were already seeing that Magdalena was suffering a mental health crisis whilst she was in uh, Egypt. So the photograph in the previous screen showed that, you know, Magdalena was just completely out of it by Friday in her room. She just wasn't herself at all. And at one point she was actually lying in the doorway of her hotel room like this. Uh, the hotel staff took pictures to send back to Magdalena's family, to Marcus, etc., just to alert them to this situation. And I think again here we see that Magdalena had gone downhill extremely rapidly. She arrived uh, at the resort on Wednesday and by Friday she was in this state. She was really in a bad way. So what was wrong with Magdalena? Well, I believe that Magdalena was suffering from situational psychosis. This is also known as travel psychosis. And you will often see lots of information on uh, travel health or travel insurance sites about this condition. It's a fairly rare condition, but it can arise. And here is an example of uh, some information provided uh, on one of these uh, types of websites. Uh, what actually happens is that in a small minority of tourists, they go to some location. It's incredibly different from maybe a holiday that they've done previously. Culturally, it's very different. It may be very far away from home. They just get completely overwhelmed to such an extent that they may actually develop psychosis, even if they've had no history of mental health issues, etc., before or mental health illness. The symptoms that occur include things like delusions, uh, disconnected thinking, um, hallucinations, they may even want to commit suicide, as drastic as that sounds, because they just want to escape the situation, they feel so fearful. I did a video about Lars Matang on this channel, and I believe that Lars also suffered from uh, situational psychosis, also known as travel psychosis. Um, it says that this type of psychosis can actually be worsened by things like alcohol, drugs, medication. For example, Lars was on extremely strong antibiotics. Um, injuries. We know that Lars was injured. Uh, he had a perforated uh, eardrum caused by a mugging. And I believe that there were a number of factors also uh, in relation to Magdalena's situation, which worsened her psychosis. She had drank a lot in the early stages of her trip and uh, she was also subjected to coercive control, which I will uh, explain now. So I, I think that Magdalena was in the grip of a very 
a serious condition and that disconnected from reality is indicated by the fact she was looking for her boyfriend who she knew wasn't on the trip she was looking for her her relatives her parents etc who she knew also you know they weren't on the trip so this is very indicative that Magdalena sort of was having a break from reality if you like uh, this disconnected thinking so something to note is that uh, Magdalena told Marcus when she arrived at the hotel that she could hear voices outside her hotel room. Equally, Lars told his mother something similar, that he felt his conversation could be heard. People were listening to him in his hotel room. So again, could this be indicative of psychosis in Magdalena, sort of delusional-like symptoms? And it is something to consider. Within travel psychosis, there are variations. For example, here's one, Paris syndrome. It's often observed in Japanese tourists, but not just in Japanese tourists. And it's where a tourist has this sort of postcard picture perfect idea of a city. So Paris is a perfect example of that. It's a very romantic city, beautiful city. But when they get there, they're really disappointed because there is also a gritty, a darker side to Paris as there is to all cities. And some tourists have been known uh, to experience nausea, hallucination, increased heart rate, etc., known as Paris syndrome. Could Magdalena have had an element of this, a very sort of romantic idea of what Egypt was like? And obviously it is a beautiful country, but as a woman traveling on your own, you also have to be careful. So this is an article on travel related psychosis, and it's in the Journal of Travel Medicine published in 2018. And it's very interesting because it talks about a phenomenon called pathological travel. Uh, and it suggests that um, on occasion, people will actually book a trip because they have some underlying mental health uh, condition in the first place. Uh, and this is something to consider with Magdalena. Perhaps you might book a trip to Paris uh, you know, with seven hours notice, but it's quite unusual to do it in the context of Egypt. Did she have some underlying uh, condition, perhaps low grade depression? And I also mentioned this in the case of Lars Matang, who, you know, made a decision to go on a trip that he wouldn't normally, it wasn't his normal kind of holiday. And he too had a lot of stresses, you know, his father was unwell, etc. Something that I do think we have to consider is Magdalena's childhood and the impact that this may have had on her. She was very close to her family, friends, her parents, but she had hard times growing up. Her father uh, was a heavy drinker and there's a lot of studies about the effects of uh, alcoholism on young children, but also on uh, you know the adult children of alcoholics. And there's a whole, um, you know, range of conditions that can arise. One can be overachieving, for example, and we know that Magdalena left home at 17 and was very determined to sort of make a go of her life. But we do see here number 12, there are 14 traits of an adult child, of the adult child of an alcoholic. And one of them is a fear of abandonment. And we do see that Magdalena had built a very nice life for herself with her family, friends, with Marcus. Here she is suddenly in a foreign country by herself already early in the trip she's asking you know where are her parents where is her boyfriend and perhaps you know this vulnerability inside of her perhaps you know relating to her childhood just suddenly surfaced mixed with um situational or travel psychosis to to really kind of put her in a very bad way mentally Something that we do have to note is that Magdalena had also consumed a lot of alcohol in the first sort of 48 hours of her trip. And this too would not have helped with, you know, the travel psychosis, perhaps feelings of abandonment due to her childhood. Put these three factors together and, and the impact on her mental health would have been quite dramatic. So in the afternoon of Friday the 28th of April, hotel staff bring Magdalena to the hospital. Now it's not uh, a mental health facility, it's just a local hospital, but they erred on the side of caution, which I think was a good call. And you can see her here walking in. Now, to my mind, and I know that her parents did think this, she appears almost sort of drugged or dazed. 
uh, you can see that she's very unsteady on her legs. We see her here in the courtyard talking on the phone. The doctors feel that perhaps she has some sort of psychosis, but they're happy that she's sort of calm enough that she can be discharged back to the hotel. So as I mentioned, Magdalena's parents felt that, you know, had something been put in Magdalena's drinks, you know, some kind of date rape drug, etc. They felt that she looked very unsteady on her feet. But this is an article that I found in the Austin Medical Science Journal, and it talks about gait, balance and posture in major mental illnesses. And I think that the way that Magdalena is walking is actually not indicative of being drugged, but actually indicative of this mental health crisis that she's suffering. So we can see here that one of the major findings of this study in the Austin Medical Science Journal is that patients, and I quote, suffering from anxiety disorders are characterized by balance disorders, unquote. So in other words, when you're in this sort of extremely uh, psychotic state, you're hyper anxious, you are terrified. This affects your balance. And I think also, as I mentioned, the travel psychosis earlier, you know, and all the anxiousness that goes with that, etc. Um, there's all this also this sort of disconnected, dazed quality that you have. And we see both of these things as Magdalena is walking into the hospital. We see that she's unsteady on her feet. She looks sort of out of it as if she's not very aware of her surroundings. And I think that this unsteadiness on her feet, this dazed look that she has, is indicative of the travel psychosis that she has. Um, she's hyper anxious and it has, you know, just affected her balance. You know, she's just, you know, totally wiped out from this mental health crisis that she's suffering. The autopsy would show that there were no uh, date rape type drugs in Magdalena's system. She was also not raped vaginally uh, uh, as well. There was no evidence of rape. And that's why I believe that sort of unbalanced dazed look that she has is more symptomatic of the sort of psychosis and the mental health crisis that she's experiencing than it is of, of date rape drugs being administered. Magdalena's family was so worried that they bought for the return date of her flight. So she was now going to fly home on the Saturday. She had arrived on the Wednesday. She would be flying home on the Saturday. So a very short trip. But they felt that once she get back to Marcus and to them and to her friends, she would recover. And I totally agree with them. Saturday would swing around and Magdalena would be found by hotel staff on the roof of the hotel. Was she contemplating jumping off? Now, again, we know that suicide ideation and the desire to commit suicide is symptomatic, you know, is one of the symptoms uh, of, you know, um, people who are suffering from psychosis. It doesn't manifest in every single person who's suffering from psychosis, but it can be a symptom. I was wondering, you know, here's the day that's come around that she's actually returning home. You would imagine that she would be feeling calmer. Um, was she afraid to tell Marcus something? Had the poor girl, you know, in a drunken state performed some kind of sexual act, maybe willingly or under duress? Was it photographed or videotaped? Was there a threat that this was going to be circulated? I mean, we do know that women have committed suicide over sexual images of, you know, that have been taken of them, you know, being circulated on social media without even the presence of psychosis being there. You know, was this some other factor? Because she does say in a video call to Marcus that, you know, the men have tricks and all that kind of uh, implication that something bad has happened to her is, is sort of fermenting in the background there. Um, so, but let's just go on the facts. At the moment, we have no evidence of that, but I, I, I just did, that's pure speculation. I, I just did wonder speculatively if you like if something bad like that had happened um regardless i do feel we see the presence of course of control even if nothing bad happened to her in the hotel and, and i think we're about to see evidence of this in this next video clip so uh she's taken to the airport by the hotel staff but the pilot won't let her on the plane he feels that she's still very out of it difficult to manage and it would be very easy to come down on the pilot but i guess you know he's just trying to be professional think of the greater good 
it's just such a shame because had Magdalena gone on that flight, I've no doubt that once she returned to the loving arms of Marcus and her family, she would have made a full recovery. Instead, she has to return to the hotel that she was staying in. They don't want to take her because they are worried she's going to self-harm. They can't manage her. She refuses to go to any hotels, which again makes me wonder, did something bad happen to her in the hotel? And eventually Mahmoud, the tour guide, uh, and his friends bring her to a hospital. Now, they obviously have to update Marcus and Mahmoud contacts uh, uh, Marcus from his phone and you could see Magdalena doing a video call into Mahmoud's phone. Now, this is a little bit of a red flag. Why is Magdalena not ringing Marcus from her own phone? And you can hear Mahmoud's friends in the background. They're talking to some kind of a boss saying that they've allowed her or let her ring Marcus. And you can see that the language has very much gone from being supportive to being control of, and controlling. And we're starting to veer in the into the territory of coercive control and why. Marcus is just incredible. I think he's a beautiful person. He, Mahmoud speaks Polish and he is aware that Mahmoud speaks Polish. And in spite of this, he's so loving to Magdalena. I mean, he calls her his bow tie, his little angel. He tells her that he will love her no matter what's happened because I think he has a suspicion that some kind of professional line has been crossed. Uh, you know, or perhaps Magdalena has done something of her own volition, her own free will. Uh, and he tells her that no matter what, he loves her. He says, look, just tell me I'm trying to gather the evidence. I'm actually recording my phone with a second device to have the evidence. A lot of people have said, why does Marcus keep saying over and over again what happened? But he's trying to get the evidence on the phone. And he's also letting the men know that, you know, he's... Uh, trying to get to the bottom of what happened. Did, was she in any way harmed? I mean, I just think he's amazing. He says that he's gonna send a friend out to collect her, to bring her back. Um, and he also says he's gonna ring the Polish embassy. He's doing everything to let her and the men in the background know that he is going to safeguard her. And he's just so affectionate, so beautiful. I've no doubt this was a very close relationship. This would have endured on into the future for the for the long term, possibly for life, I believe, had Magdalena managed to make it back from Egypt. Uh, there are, again, another few red flags that uh, make me feel that we're starting to enter the course of control territory. When Marcus mentions he's going to ring the embassy, the men in the background start asking, what is the number of the Polish embassy? Are they trying to control the narrative? Um, or just get their side across. I'll be really interested to see your comments. So I'm just going to play a clip of that video call now. Powiedz mi szybko. No, dawaj. Raz, dwa. Nie mogę mówić, przepraszam. Musisz powiedzieć mi, skarbie, proszę cię. Panie, to nic nie da. Ale powiedz mi, co, powiedz mi, ja to muszę wiedzieć. Ja to muszę wiedzieć, żeby cię chronić, rozumiesz? Powiedz mi, proszę cię. Aniołku, co się wydarzyło? Powiedz mi, musisz mi to powiedzieć. Musisz, wszystko, cokolwiek by to nie było. Powiedz mi, no mów. Mów, myszko. Powiedz mi. Skarbie, powiedz, no śmiało. Już jesteś blisko, powiedz. No dasz radę, powiedz mi, myszko. Cokolwiek by to nie było, musisz mi powiedzieć. Ja muszę mieć tą informację. Myszko. Ale teraz, normalnie tak jak teraz mi powiedziałaś, tak mi powiedz. Nic się nie bój. Ja mam kontakt z ambasadą, Maciek po ciebie leci. Powiedz mi, co się dzieje. Co się stało, Myszko? Powiedz mi. Nawet najgorsze, co by miało być. Musisz mi powiedzieć. Powiedz mi. Myszko, muszę to wiedzieć i to szybko. Kochanie, ufasz mi? Ufasz mi, kochanie? Tak. To powiedz mi. Bo ja chcę cię chronić. Powiedz mi, proszę cię, tylko musisz mi to powiedzieć szybko, teraz. Co się stało? Mów. Powiedz śmiało, szybko, będziemy mieli to z głowy. M. Co M? Co M? Ten rezydent? 
Tak? Myszko, powiedz. Tak? Co się stało? Myszko, powiedz mi, proszę cię. Has harmed her, and when Marcus presses, he says, "You know, is it Mahmoud?" But Marcus actually misses a cue from Magdalena. She actually does this very slow, deliberate nod. Um, she's petrified to say in front of the man what actually happened, and you can see that throughout. She's saying, "I can't talk in front of the man," uh, etc. So there are a lot of red flags in terms of Magdalena not calling from her phone. The men saying that they're also going to ring the Polish embassy. Uh, her being terrified to speak in front of them. I personally feel that at this point, we've moved away from a situation in which Magdalena is being supported to one in which she's being controlled. And that coercive control, and I'm, I'm going to outline the features of coercive control, are present at this point. Um, I looked up the responsibilities of a travel organiser, removed as a tour guide, you know, in situations when tourists are in difficulty. And it does say here, this is the Citizens Advice webpage in Ireland, that a tour operator must give information about healthcare, consular assistance. Um, and we do know that in fairness to Mahmoud and the hotel workers, the men, Magdalena was brought to hospital. Her family was appraised of the situation. Perhaps they just mentioned the Polish embassy because it's a step that they've forgotten to do. The only thing is, Mahmoud's friends mention it, Mahmoud mentions it. There's just a slight overkill about it that makes me a little uneasy. Um, and it does say here that also the tour, oper tour operator should arrange for long distance calls, etc. And we do see them doing that. But it's just the kind of vibe, the atmosphere that makes me feel, okay, they're following the steps, but this isn't support anymore. It, you can tell from the footage that was just played that, that it has veered into control and being controlled when you're very mentally fragile like that must be absolutely terrifying and I think it made a bad situation for Magdalena a thousand times worse. We do have to consider that possibly as part of her sort of psychotic state Magdalena could have been experiencing persecutory delusions and it says here in this article uh, in a high quality psychiatric journal that persecutory delusions are a core central uh, psychotic experience. So this imagining that somebody's out to get you, somebody's out to harm you, etc. So, you know, could Magdalena have had this perceived threat and perhaps the men weren't in any way harming uh, to her? In this same academic article, it talks about 70% of people who were suffering a first episode of psychosis, and this was probably a first episode for Magdalena, have persecutory delusions and are likely to act on them. So we saw Lars Matang run out of the airport. Magdalena also followed her heart. She jumped out of the window. She, she did what you know she felt she needed to do. So they act on these delusions. Having said all that, I do feel that the men, they were following the steps that they needed to follow, but there's just a slight sense that perhaps, you know, they have been heavy handed in their approach. Um, and maybe there is an element of them trying to cover their tracks. Uh, Magdalena is so insistent that, you know, tricks have been played on her, you know, something's been done to her. They seem very keen to get to talk to the Polish embassy almost first. Um, at one point, a man in the background when uh, Marcus and Magdalena are talking on the video call is saying, you know, she's been crying ever since, but I don't think he's going to do anything about it because, you know, he's too soft. You know, was some line crossed? Well, we have no proof of this. We can conjecture, we can speculate, but I do think we have proof of coercive control. I think the fact she wasn't calling from her own phone, etc. Just uh, and other things which I'll discuss now make me think that. She was, at the very least, subjected to coercive control. So what is coercive control? Well, coercive control happens when, um, you know, in some kind of partnership arrangement. It could be, for example, two men, two women, a man and a woman. They're in a partnership, a relationship, 
and um, you know one is dominating the other and you can see here it says on medical news today the person can decide you know what their partner the more dominant one will decide what their partner wears where they go who they associate with uh, what activities they take part in they may control the person's access to a phone a computer email etc and um, I believe that we see t we see this dynamic playing out in the interactions, not between Magdalena and Marcus, who are actually in the relationship, but in the interactions with Mahmoud and his friends. They've kind of gone from supporting Magdalena to dominating Magdalena. And when you have uh, good mental health, this kind of dynamic is is you know really stressful and can push people over the edge. But when you have poor mental health as Magdalena currently is experiencing, you know, she's having a mental health crisis. This is absolutely uh, terrifying. Screenshot, we see Mahmoud in the phone there. Um, you can see that Marcus is actually asking Mahmoud about Magdalena's phone. Why is her phone turned off? They want to be able to reach her. Perhaps they've been trying to reach her on her own phone and they can't. And um, I, I think that you can sense in Marcus's voice a kind of concern that Magdalena has lost independence and autonomy. Now, one could argue she's having a mental health crisis. They are just trying to sort of mind her, but she's perfectly capable of speaking on her own phone at this point, even in her distressed state. Um, you know, and at the end of this video conversation, this is a screenshot from that video conversation that Magdalena and Marcus had outside the hospital. Um, on the Saturday evening and uh, at the end of the call you can actually hear Marcus say you know as he's turned off the phone there's something there there's something not right you know uh, and, and he's concerned so this dynamic between Mahmoud his friends and Magdalena to me it is classic coercive control they uh, as I said have gone from supporting her to dominating her you know they're watching what she says uh you know when Mahmoud actually sends this um recording that he made of Magdalena speaking to Marcus the file has actually been trimmed and the file is actually called trim and again you know this uh, inquiring about the Polish embassy you just really do feel at all times they're watching what Magdalena is saying she's clearly very afraid to speak in front of them it, it's just there's some red flags there uh and, and to me we could speculate about what has happened to Magdalena, have some other bad things happen to her, but I think we can only go on the facts. And I think factually in the video uh, exchange, you can see the characteristics of coercive control. So in this screenshot, that's actually Mahmoud's face in the uh, phone there. And he's asking um, Marcus, you know, what is the number of the Polish embassy? And we also hear some of Mahmoud's friends um, asking the boss that they're talking to what is the number of the Polish embassy it's just slightly overkill to me it feels less like they're ensuring that they followed every step and a little bit more like they're sort of trying to control the narrative now somebody could argue as well that you know maybe they're just trying to put their side of the story uh, across but again all of this just feels like monitoring controlling um, it's just got the vibe of coercive control about it there's other features of coercive control we see here in medical news today again you know things like isolating the other person um we see magdalena growing increasingly isolated she's uh, constantly surrounded by three or four men at all times and she just doesn't seem to have her own voice anymore uh there's often a very insulting dynamic well muhammad uh muhammad's friends in the background are insulting in their own language uh, Marcus's manhood. They're describing Magdalena as a nut. Um, and also there can be threats of physical violence, public humiliation. It even says here that they can, um, in course of control apologies, um, sexually explicit images can also be a threat. You know, the release of sexually explicit images. Now we can't be certain that anything like that has happened to Magdalena, though, you know, she does talk about tricks being played on her and the fear she has of explaining to Marcus, you know, what has happened to her. It really made me wonder, could that have been something that, you know, happened to her? She may have engaged in something even willingly, the poor girl in her drunken state, and maybe some image was taken and this is now being, you know, you know, hung over her, if you like, you know, as a kind of a threat. 
but we have no evidence at the same time of this so we do have to be very careful and we can only go on the evidence that we have and I think that the video exchange between Marcus and Magdalena is a very strong piece of evidence and I think that we see a lot of the features of coercive control you know the monitoring you know uh, of activities, the access to the phone, the insults, the isolation. I think that we can see a lot of those features. Of course, of control isn't just something that happens in a romantic uh, relationship. It can happen in any relationship where there's a, you know, the power dynamic becomes unbalanced. And, and we very much see that happening here. I mean, Magdalena literally looks at the, as if she's at the mercy of Muhammad and his friends. It's very, very um, concerning another screenshot from that video exchange between Marcus and Magdalena and you can see that the men in the background uh, one of the men is actually saying to this boss that he's talking to on a phone that um, you know Marcus has a very small manhood you know he's no threat to them um, you know uh, they don't think he's going to do anything which again that language makes me feel like something has actually happened um, but again, we see this very insulting vibe. It's a very threatening uh, atmosphere for Magdalena, who's already very vulnerable. You know, she just wasn't getting the support that she needed. She's being dominated in a very aggressive manner. This is a very interesting podcast, which explores the psychological impact of coercive control. Uh, a number of experts speak on the topic and there are also a number of studies referenced as well. And it does describe the feelings of fear, of powerlessness, of helplessness that the victims of coercive control can experience. Uh, if you're completely dominated by a small group of people as you're going through a mental health crisis, uh, this is incredibly frightening. You know, a person can po potentially see no way out of the situation and it does say and I've circled it there in red that you know the rate of suicide is much higher you know uh, than people might think in this sort of co coercive control type dynamic people just sort of give up they feel they can't control events and we can see this with Magdalena where she says to Marcus you know you might as well go to work she says this in the video call I'm never going to get out of this there's no hope I'm never going to escape this it's pointless and I think that we we really do see the psychological effects of course of control playing out in relation to Magdalena. So things are about to get a lot worse for Magdalena. She's just got off the phone from the video call with um, Marcus. She's now in the hospital and the men for starters who were not medical staff should have been asked to leave. I mean, Magdalena, I believe has psychosis. She feels abandoned, she's frightened, and now she's just uh, surrounded by people. I mean, the man on the left there looks almost as if he's shielding what is happening from the cameras. Um, they've just overstepped the mark. This isn't support. This is being overpowering, uh, dominance. It's just the complete inappropriate response. Uh, it's just making everything a thousand times worse. If those two men had just even left, I think it would have even been better. Now things are about to get even worse in that, you know, four men are going to carry Magdalena off to the hospital room. She's going to be tied to a bed there with towels, which is a protocol for somebody who is distressed. She's given antipsychotic medication that turns up in the toxicology report later. Uh, there isn't any presence of date rape drugs or anything that's why I was saying I felt that her unbalanced walk was more to do with the anxiety and the sort of psychosis she's experiencing so she's tied to this bed and at this point the poor woman must be so confused I believe she's got psychosis there's the feelings of abandonment she's miles away from home uh, she has been literally dominated by these men for the last few days. It's coercive control. She's thinking, what's coming next? Now I'm tied to a bed. She probably thought she was about to be raped. She mightn't even have fully realised she was even in a hospital room. She might have thought she was in her hotel room, you know, in her confused state. And she asks to go to the bathroom. The nurse unties her. Uh, she attacks the nurse and then literally just jumps out the window. Now, was it suicide? Was it an attempt to escape? It could have been accidental death. She was just trying to, like Lars Matang, just get away from this sense of danger. 
uh, and, you know, just run away. Or it could, she just felt, you know, I'm never going to get out of this. I'm just going to commit uh, suicide. And you can see that she's got a lot of the symptoms of a victim of coercive control, that helplessness. I mean, at one point in the video exchange with Marcus, she says, you know, I'm never going to get out of here. She just can't see past this control and this dominance. I believe that Magdalena still had the chance to survive at this point. I think that had she been provided with support as opposed to coercive control, there's a big difference between support and dominance. I think she would still be alive and that if had it been more gender balanced, perhaps a man and a woman had brought her to hospital um, more respectful, you know, language and speaking around her and all of the above. Uh, I just think that the approach to dealing with her was very heavy handed, rough around the edges. It heightened all her fears. It heightened her desire to just escape, get out that window. And I think if she'd had a softer um, approach, you know, in the way that Marcus was doing it, you know, even one of the men in the background said, you know, Marcus is calming her down. I, I think it would never have got to this. And I think that she didn't receive uh, the proper care and response as a tourist in difficulty. I, I don't believe that she did. So what do I feel happened to Magdalena? Well, first, I'd like to say before I just give my uh, summing up, if you like, that we've got to be careful of cultural stereotypes. You know, there's this cultural stereotype that all Egyptian men are running after, you know, tourists, female tourists, etc. Um, I mean, I'm an Irish woman. I know what cultural stereotypes are like uh, to a far lesser degree, I would say, than my mother and my grandmother. But I do know what those stereotypes are like and how frustrating they are. And I'm sure many Egyptian men also have experienced stereotypes in the context of their country, which are really frustrating. So I've tried to distill down what I believe happened just purely on a factual basis from what we can see in the video footage and other pieces of evidence that we have. And I've also then tried to use research to back up my arguments. So I feel that Magdalena had a difficult childhood. I think issues of abandonment came to the fore and overpowered her when she was in Egypt. She had a very loving childhood and her parents were wonderful, but there may have been you know, uh, some low grade depression there that she mightn't even have been fully conscious of due to alcohol issues in the home, etc. But there is no doubt you know, what great parents she had and how much they tried to do for her throughout her life and through her difficulties in Egypt. They were just incredible. I think that the trip itself may have been indicative of what's called pathological travel. The trip was made, again, because of some underlying health, mental health issue, perhaps again, a low grade depression, or, you know, it could even be bipolar, but I believe probably something more like a low grade depression to book a trip to Egypt, a last minute trip to Egypt is quite something you might do it to Paris or somewhere, but to Egypt, it's a little out of the ordinary. I think that once Magdalena got to Egypt, she then progressed on to developing um, travel psychosis or situational psychosis. This could have been an easy progression if there was also some kind of underlying mental health issue, even a very low grade depression that she wasn't even aware of. But I think even if there wasn't the presence of a low grade depression, I think it's obvious that she had some sort of psychosis and this was worsened by heavy alcohol consumption. And she most likely had persecutory delusions. Uh, I've, I've, I think this case is very, very similar to the Lars Matan case where she felt somebody was really trying to seriously harm her and she would never make it back to Poland alive. But I think what tipped everything in the dark direction that it took was the coercive control. I think that even though the hotel staff, Mahmoud, his friends, etc., on the face of it, followed the steps of, you know, take her to the hospital, making sure relatives were informed, etc., I think that they veered away from support to control in a very heavy handed way. Uh, you know, there didn't seem to be very much sensitivity displayed. Um, you know, it, it, it veered into the aggressive, the jeering, a lot of laughing in the background, which must have been very frightening to Magdalena when she was, you know, really in a bad state. And I think ultimately Magdalena wasn't provided with the duty of care that she should have been. I think there should have been, for starters, a more gender balanced 
response to her health mental health crisis i think that if perhaps a man and a woman had taken her to the hospital she might still be here today i think that just this constant presence of three or four men even to the extent of once she entered the hospital she seemed desperate to get rid of them she probably thought you know i'm safe now that i'm in the hospital but those men were still there uh, i just don't think she was provided with the sensitive and sort of you know gentle care that she needed in this distressed state. I want to conclude by referencing Marcus's incredible and heroic response. I mean, here's a screenshot of that video exchange between Magdalena and Marcus. And he says, Mouse, no matter what happened, I still love you. Tell me what happened. He's just saying, I will love you no matter what. And I I honestly believe he she could have told him the most awful, awful thing. And I think their love would have actually survived it. And I think that's probably one of the most tragic things about this story. It, it wasn't just the death of Magdalena. It was the death of a really wonderful love story between two people that I believe would have endured. Before I wrap up, there's something else that I do want to mention. On the Thursday, Magdalena's phone or the signal of Magdalena's phone was picked up in the ocean quite a distance from the shore. Had she been out on a boat? Now, I think this can be ruled out because apparently hotel staff and also people staying in the hotel say that she was there on the Thursday. Something else to note is that apparently Mahmood and uh, Marcus were also friendly on Facebook. Well, Mahmood had Marcus's number in his phone when he was uh, ringing Magdalena to reassure Marcus, you know, about what was happening. Um, I don't think it's that unusual that they're connected on Facebook. Mahmoud also spoke Polish. You know, perhaps they had some similar acquaintances. Um, I don't think it has any significance at all. I'd just like to end with a positive image of Magdalena. She packed a lot into her 27 years, including, you know, career aspirations. She had a fantastic relationship with her family, her parents, her sister and a wonderful relationship with Marcus. So there was a lot of love in Magdalena's life. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please do like, subscribe or comment. Every like, every comment, every new subscriber means the absolute world to me. I hope you really enjoy the holidays, however you spend them. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Dark Vanishings. My next case is going to be the Maura Murray case. Uh, do take care and all the best. And here's to a great 2023. Thank you all again for your support in 2022.